Good morning. Welcome again to our daily morning worship and prayer. And for this morning, we're going to look at a very big psalm where in 12 verses, we will cover all of the earth and all of history. And so when we realize and acknowledge how big the God is that we serve, really we are overwhelmed and sometimes the only proper response is worship. So let's begin this morning by worshiping the big God that we serve.
Expectations fall, you never change. You're unfailing through it all, God. All creation shouts and sings to the unshakable King. You are unshakable, faithful to the end. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Oh God, you are worthy. We lift you up, oh God. Amen. All right, we are now in Psalm chapter 2. And yesterday, when we looked at Psalm chapter 1, it was a very personal psalm. It had to do with our personal relationship with God. But in Psalm chapter 2, this is a very big psalm. It covers all of men, all of the nations, all of history, and all of creation. And the point of the psalmist is that God is Lord over us individually, but not just us individually, God is Lord over all of creation. And that truth carries with it both hope and a warning. So we're going to read through the whole psalm. It's only a short psalm, 12 verses, but we'll chop it up into three sections, beginning in verses 1 to 3. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth, they set themselves and the rulers, they take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Now, Psalm 2 was actually, is actually a royal psalm, meaning it refers to the Davidic, lines of, the Davidic line of kings. And at that time, uh, during Israel's time, whenever there, a new king was enthroned, that was actually a time of political instability because there's a new king. And usually, if you read First and Second Kings, they're usually young when they take over the throne. And so the subject nations and leaders of those nations or pagan kings would take advantage of a transition uh, on the throne by organizing themselves uh, for a revolt. So that's what this psalm was talking about, the nations plotting in rage, conspiring against the king. But obviously, this is more than just a royal psalm. This is a messianic psalm. That word anointed or anointed one in verse 2 is where we get the English word messiah. Okay, so this was definitely a messianic psalm. And in the same way that pagan kings organized themselves against the Davidic kings, the nations from the Tower of Babel until today, really, have been conspiring and defying God and Jesus Christ. And that's why even Peter and John in Acts chapter 4, they use this psalm, Psalm 2, to explain how Rome conspired with the religious leaders of Israel to crucify Jesus Christ. So that's the background of this psalm. Let's pick it up in verse 4 to 8. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. And so what the psalmist was saying originally is that when you defy any of the Davidic kings, you're defying God. You're not just setting yourselves up against some human king. You are setting yourself up against the God of the nations who set this king before us, appointed him. And you know what he was saying? God was not the least bit intimidated when nations conspire against God. In fact, he said God laughs in heaven. Because Jeremiah said in chapter 10, you know what? It's not in man to set his steps. We think we can order our steps. But in reality, it's God who orders man's steps, the nation's steps, and all of history's steps toward his preordained end. In other words, God is orchestrating all of human history towards his predetermined end. It's been set even before creation, 
There is no discussion. There is no debate. It's been settled. And any acts of rebellion or outrage that we commit doesn't change anything. That at the end of human history, Jesus Christ will sit enthroned as the Lord of the nations. In fact, Colossians says that it's in Christ, through Him, by Him, for Him, that all things were created and hold together. So Jesus Christ already rules and reigns all of creation. But God's response to man's rebellion wasn't to strike back. It was to send His one and only Son to die on the cross for our sins. And because of that, Philippians 2 says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord. So from the very beginning, even before all of creation, God is marching history towards only one end, that Jesus Christ will rule and will reign over all of the earth, over every nation, to the ends of the earth. His rule challenges our man's political systems, our uh, socioeconomic processes, our, our false ideologies, and our false religions to only one end, that Jesus will rule and reign, His kingdom will come on earth just as it is in heaven. Verses 9 to 12, You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Nations will continue to defy God, but even that will end. Rulers come and go. Nations come and go. Empires come and go. But God's rule is eternal. And so long as we revolt and rebel and defy God, we will realize that the righteousness, peace, joy, and justice that we all seek can only come through the rule of God. It doesn't come through politics. It doesn't come through technology. It doesn't come through man's best efforts. It only comes as we submit ourselves to the rule of God over our lives. And that is why the psalm started with a rhetorical question. Why? Why did the nations plot in vain? It's futile because man's rule will come to an end and everything will serve to fulfill God's pre-intended history history's end and purpose, which is for all of us to bow before God. See, God decreed from the very beginning for the nations to relate to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, through Jesus' finished work on the cross. And that's why there's really only two endings for peoples and nations, judgment or salvation. If we persist in our rebellion, we perish. But if we humble ourselves and repent and acknowledge and submit to His Lordship, we will be saved. Let me just end with this thought. We read how in Colossians, God really already rules over all of creation because from the very beginning, everything was created through Jesus Christ. And yet Psalm 2 and even Philippians 2 says, God will inherit the nations and He will rule future tense all of the earth, and all of creation. So, in a sense, Jesus is already king of everything, but in a future sense, he will become the king of all of creation. Well, there's kind of two senses to that. First, God already rules because he created everything and owns everything. But in a second sense, the nations and all of creation will bow down to the name of Jesus Christ. That's a future tense. And so in the second sense, it's a rule of God that's not imposed from above, but it's a rule that's offered as a gift to the nations. And this gift is offered as we preach the gospel to the nations 
and they respond to the gospel and acknowledge Jesus Christ both as Lord and as Savior. That's where we come in. That's where the people of God come in. We get to offer the rule of God to the nations, to all peoples, by taking the gospel to all the nations of the world. Like in Victory and in every nation, we say we do that. We take the gospel to the nations by praying, by giving, and by going. Again, that's why we're called every nation, because that is our vision, to see the gospel preached in every nation. So in summary, this psalm started with the nations rebelling against God, but it ends with God's rule, absolute rule, firmly established over all the nations of the earth. That's the story of human history. Man will continue to rebel, but as we, the people of God, extend the rule of God to the ends of the earth through the preaching of the gospel, it will all come to only one end. That is, every nation, every people, every tongue, every tribe confessing the name of Jesus Christ as Lord. And so again, as we reflect on how big and how huge God is and the scope of His authority, all of history, all the nations, and all of creation, the only rightful response is to worship Him. So let's worship Him again. Lift Him up. Who you are is who you are, yes. Who you are, you always will be. Seated in the highest place, the unshakable King. Sing who you were is who you are. Even as we have a role in extending God's rule to the ends of the earth by praying, giving, and going, I just want to challenge you this morning. Pray for the nations. Ask God to put a nation in your heart and commit you know, to as a family or individually start praying for that nation. Or maybe you can start praying for one of the missionaries from your local Victory Church. If you're not sure who your missionary is, please call your local Victory Church pastor. But number two, Again, we went broad, we went big by talking about the nations. But again, this also has a personal application in that, again, Lord, Jesus is Lord over all of creation, but He is also Lord of our personal lives. So just like the nations, we also should stop resisting God's Lordship over our lives. So if there is still an area in your life that you know that you haven't fully submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, I want to give you that opportunity right now, right this morning. So if there's an area of your life that you know that you've held back from God, that you refuse to surrender to Jesus Christ, do that right now. Just sur It's futile. Okay? It's futile to continue resisting the power and the grace of God on your lives. So take the next few seconds, whatever that is in your heart, just surrender it to Jesus Christ, to the altar and the Lordship of God. Do that now.
Lord, I stand in faith and prayer together with everyone right now who's listening to this morning worship and prayer, Lord, even as they surrender this area of their lives to you fully, 110%, with nothing held back, because you truly are, Lord, not just over all of the earth, but our Lord in our lives, and Lord, in every area of our lives, Lord, our families, our vocation, our hobbies, our leisure time, our children, our relationships, our finances, our work, Lord, we surrender every area of your lives. And Lord, we speak the rule of God over our lives. Your righteousness, your peace, your joy, your justice, and your lordship. We give you, Father, all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Before we go, let me just bless you again out of Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Hallelujah. Good morning. Thank you again for joining us today. Join us again tomorrow and for the next several mornings. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.